Amen. We're having a great time. I want to thank the churches, the local churches, for coming out. And uh, Bakis for driving all the way up from California. Amen. Uh, to celebrate with his mother church. Thank God for that. And every, all of you that are here tonight, those of you that might be live streaming, we want to welcome you as well. Thankful what God is doing. 40th anniversary, what a milestone. And, uh, you know, I can't wait for part three. Amen? I mean, Tyrese, he's, that guy knows how to do some videos. Amen. I appreciate Tyrese. Let's give him a hand already. Amen. Mostly I want part three, so I'm, my mug's not up there anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. And 40 years is a miracle. It is a miracle, but I can tell you this, it's not over. Amen. 40 years is just a milestone, and we're here to celebrate that and rejoice in that and, and look back. It's okay. Uh, regale the past. Laugh at all the people's skinny faces and have a great time, but it's not over. And uh, this church is a miracle church, as every fellowship church is a miracle church. Now, to last 40 years... And not just to survive, but to thrive is a miracle. Amen. And what we're a part of is a miracle. And we are the result of a genius strategy that God gave Pastor Wayman Mitchell. Amen. And we're going to continue to thrive. And we're going to continue to build the kingdom of God as long as we stay true to the pattern that Pastor Mitchell has laid down for us. We don't go after the shiny new pennies. Amen. Hallelujah. I like the fact that what we do is what we do, and we've remained true to it, and I believe that is a key to why we've lasted so long. You know, the church in America, they say the church as a whole is in major trouble. I don't know if you've been reading any of the articles, but there are lots of articles. I have an article from a trade magazine. This is a, a trade magazine of, uh, that, that uh, caters to the municipalities, cities, uh, people who work in cities, planning, uh, planners of cities, and, uh, and uh, they're talking uh, about churches that are closing. And it says, across the country, houses of worship are shuttering by the thousands, Municipalities have a role in finding new uses for these abandoned buildings and have long, that have long anchored communities and neighborhoods. Sad, vacant, derelict houses. Now, maybe some devil wrote this. I don't know. Of worship at the hearts of cities and towns will become more frequent sites as more of them shutter their doors. They estimate that the next few years, this was written about six, seven months ago, could see as many as 100,000 of the nation's estimated 384,000 churches and other houses of worship close, too often deteriorating into neighborhood eyesores. And so they're trying to figure out, what are we going to do with all these shuttered churches? Well, I know what we'll do. We'll buy them for a dime on a dollar. Can you say amen? And, and to, we'll take them. Because this article is about the nominal church, a church in name only, not a real move of God, I believe. And we're going to continue to thrive, and we're going to continue to do God's will if we remain true to a couple of basic principles that I want to preach on tonight. And I want to minister out of the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. Two verses of scripture, uh, chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. I want to preach a message I've entitled, The House with Golden Windows. The House with Golden Windows. There was a young man who would get up each and every morning. And he would look across a deep divide, a, a valley. And he would marvel every morning he was look. Miles across this valley, he would see a house. And he marveled at it because that house had the most beautiful windows. They were golden. They were laced with diamonds, it looked like, from the distance that he was at. 
So he would look at that and just say, that's the most beautiful house in the world. It has golden windows. And he would get up and he would look and he would find himself wishing that he could, he could live in that house. Wishing that he could be there and see this house and, and live it. He said, I would really be happy if I could live there and, and, and not where I'm at right now. I would be happy if I went there and not stay here. One morning he had a day off. He had some time, so he made up his mind, I'm going to go and I'm going to see for myself up close that house that has the golden windows. I'm going to go there and see it. So he hiked down to the deep valley. He cut his way across that valley and, uh, and looking for that house with the golden windows. He went down the ravine, picked his way from the bottom up. Noon comes and then near the end of the day, he finally scales that final part of that climb and he finds himself in front of this house and he looks at this house and lo and behold, it does not have golden windows. So he knocks on the door, he goes to the door, he's looking around, where's that house with golden windows? So he knocks on the door, the owner of the house answers the door and he says, I'm looking for the house with the golden windows. And he's there around. Now it's getting late in the day. Sun, sun has begun to set. And the owner goes, turn around. And he points across the ravine to the house that the man lived in and said, look, that's the house with the golden windows. Our church, your church, you must see it as the house with the golden windows. You must have a love and an appreciation for God, where God has placed you. And in order for a church to thrive, I believe in order for a church to grow and thrive and 40 years be later still be thriving and growing and planting churches and winning the world for Jesus, that spirit has to be in the heart of those who are part of the building of that church. Amen. Because this is what will keep a church moving. Not just surviving, but thriving. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, says these words. Then I said to them, you see the distress we are in, or we... That we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste. This is Nehemiah speaking. And its gates, gates are burned with fire. He says, come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of God, of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me to go and build. So they said, let us rise up and build. Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. How many believe the church is a good work? Amen. The setting you know, if you're a Bible reader, you know. 2 Samuel 5, 1 Chronicles 11, it records the capture of what was then a Jebusite stronghold in Zion by King David and his men. This is an area of real estate that I'm sure you're aware of that has been fought over again and again and again. It's even till this very day that this place, Jerusalem, has been fought over and it's been attacked, it's been plundered, it's been besieged. It's been barbed wired, it's been bombed, it's had riots, it's had shootings, it's had deaths, uh, on and on countless times, uh, but always this special place, Jerusalem, would rise from the ashes of defeat. And so one of the men who brought it back 
was from a century of desolation was a man by the name of Nehemiah. And our text tells us that there was a decision to, made to begin to build the wall. Once again, build the testimony of God. Once again, fortify this beautiful city, Jerusalem, with walls. And he said, let's start building. And I remember being a new convert, and our pastors would say things like, despise not the day of small beginnings. How, how many remember those sermons? I remember lots of those sermons. Despise not the day of small beginnings, our pastors would tell us. And they would impart vision that God was going to do something powerful in, here in Las Vegas. That one day we would be a church planting church. We would be a candlestick church. We would be a place that would reach all the world. And I re remember those sermons. Do not despise the day of small beginnings, but let's get to work building the kingdom of God. And so we began a good work. Hallelujah. And we celebrate that tonight, don't we? The Bible tells us a bit about Nehemiah, that he was a captive in a strange land. We know that. But Nehemiah didn't dwell on his condition or his circumstances, but he got a burden. He got a burden for Jerusalem, getting to the choir of Jerusalem. And he did something that we should all do tonight. And that is wherever your God plants you, you should bloom there. You should grow there. You should mature there. You should become fruitful in the place that God puts you. Hallelujah. Where we are planted. Some 150 years earlier, we know that Jerusalem had fallen to the Babylonians. City walls were torn down. The temple was ransacked. It was destroyed again. 50 years later, the Babylonian Empire gave way to the Persian Empire. And it was at that time that Cyrus began to allow the children of Israel to go back to Jerusalem. And so for a hundred years they lived in the dilapidated city. There was Ezra that came in and rebuilt some of the temple and restored some of the worship. But it was still dilapidated and they needed help. And that help came in the form of a man named Nehemiah. He was the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. He received news that Jerusalem is in shambles. There's no walls, there's no gates, there's no protection. There's vulnerability that is going on there. And so Nehemiah made his way to this city of Jerusalem and to oversee the building project. And we know, if you've read the book of Nehemiah, there was opposition on the right, the left, amen, from within with and, in, and without. But we also read that Nehemiah rallied the people and said, rise and build. Let's rebuild the walls of this great city. And for any preacher, for any Christian, we know Nehemiah is an inspiration, isn't he? I mean, when we hear the word name Nehemiah or we read about him, we say, that is, that is inspiring a man who got a burden. Hallelujah. A man who made a decision. A man who acted and made a decision that he was going to build and do something for God. And so he gets there and now the challenge is, how do we build quickly and as strongly as can be done without cutting corners. And so, Nehemiah, as you move through chapter 2, you read about this burden, you read about the testimony, and then chapter 3, I love chapter 3 of Nehemiah, because it begins to name and list those who engaged in this building. These, these were men who, who made a decision to do something for God and build, and it reveals the plan that God gave him to build. And this strategy was a genius strategy. He gave him a strategy that would allow the volunteers to rebuild the wall. 
And you read through that chapter and it lists all kinds of different individuals, different people from all different walks of life, because that's the kind of people that God brings in to build his kingdom. People from all different walks of life. Hallelujah. A gambler. A carpet layer. Hallelujah. A lawn cutter. An office guy. All kinds of different people. God brings them together. And they begin to build something for God. Hallelujah. And Nehemiah 3 again reveals that plan. And as you read down through that, that, that chapter is, is a tremendous chapter because no less than eight times in the third chapter of Nehemiah, we read that people repaired the wall in front of their own house. Have you ever read that? The Bible says, and so-and-so did this in front of their own house. And -and so-and-so did that in front of their house. And -and so-and-so did that in front of that house. What a genius strategy to, to allow the people to have a vested interest. That they would build that wall quickly in front of their own house. That they would build that wall strong in front of their own house. And I'm telling you, what needs to get in a church's heart and the spirit of the people is a spirit that you have a vested interest in what God is doing in your church. Hallelujah. That you're, you, if you get all in, if you make a decision to build, if you make a decision to be faithful, God will use you and you will have a vested interest in your church And and a person that has a vested interest in their church is a man or a woman who the devil can't run off. Can you say amen? You ain't running me off, devil. I have an interest. This is my church. Amen. And I'm committed to this church. And I'm going to see this church have revival. That's what my heart is. And the devil comes, and those are fighting words. Instead of words of discouragement, I just need to get out of here. Nice try. I have a vested interest here. This is my church. This is where God's planted me. And I'm going to do the will of God to the best of my ability. That will make a church go. That's what will make a church go. There's a bunch of people like these sitting up here that will rally together and say, we're going to build this church on Fort Apache. Can you say amen? amen? And say, you know what? We're going to have revival. You get a few like that, and that's what's going to happen. Because there's a heart, there's a vested interest there. And so this, this is a strategy, was to allow all who would to build right in front of their own house. What a genius strategy. Jedediah, Zadok, Shemaiah, Hananiah, Hanum, Meshulam, the list goes on and on and on. Each workman's task was not far from their front door. The walls were quickly and soundly built, 52 days to rebuild the walls of that great city. It happened because there was a vested interest in the people who were involved in that work. Do you have a vested interest in your church? Hey, man, I, you know, church isn't just a place you, you come, you know, and, 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 you know, you do your thing, you know. I understand some churches are a place to do business. It's, the church, it's a place to, you know, connect. It's a place to sell your wares or do this or do that. Or it's a place to make friends. It's a place to do this. It's the place to be an upstanding member of the community when you run for mayor. I don't know. Uh, amen. But I'm telling you, that's not what the church is. The church is people together building God's kingdom. And I'm telling you, that's why this church is what it is. Because God put together a small group of people who made up their minds. We're going to build the kingdom of God. Come hell or high water. Devil ain't going to kick us out, run us off. And it's a commitment. And would to God every church could have that kind of commitment in the people. 
Not just a place all, you know, if, if, as long as you, the preacher keeps me happy. Amen? As long as nobody gives me a hard time. As long as I don't get in, you know, a scuffle or, or you know, in a disagreement with somebody. As long as nobody just do, doesn't try to stab me in the back or talk about me. I'm good with the church. Hey, you could stab me in the back. You could kick me. You could call me names, but you're not running me out of my church. Could somebody say amen. You would, there, was, there was something there. I said, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. This is my destiny. This is what I was created to do. Build the kingdom of God. And what I want you to understand is each workman's task was right there. It wasn't far away. Each person's duty was right in front of them. Do you understand that? Look at not, I'm not going to say I'm old because I don't feel old. Okay? And please stop laughing at my pictures. I don't feel old. I really don't. But the truth is this. One day, I'm not going to be here. Amen. That, that's life. That's life. One day, the older people are not going to be here, and it's going to be up to you. You. You, you kids that we call you. You young people, you 20-somethings, 30-somethings. It's going to be up to you to make sure this church has an 80-year celebration. It's up to you. And you got to get in your heart that this is the will of God. And this is what I'm going to give my life to. There was everybody was called to work. Verse 1 talks about priests, Levites. Verse 12, the leaders of the city. Shalom, the Bible says, was a leader of half the city. Friends of the work. People from Jericho came, from Mizpah, from Tekoa. Families came. Shalom, the Bible says, Shalom and his daughters built the wall in front of their house. Hard-working girls. Can you say amen? Back when a man could still work. Back when a girl could still cook and chop wood. <laughs> Tell you, we've had, we got some tough ladies in this church. Beautiful ladies, but tough. Tell you, there's some, there's some ladies in this church been around a little while. Better not mess with them. Because they're women of prayer. They've been on outreaches. Amen. We were just talking about some of the early outreaches down to Naked City. Pastor Payne said, he goes, here it is. A bunch of white people going down to Naked City. Middle class white people going down to the, where the Marielito boat lift had just landed. Where Ca Fidel Castro opened all the prisons and let all the prisoners free and they came, they came to Naked City. The kingdom isn't for sissies. You're going to have to be tough. I'm telling you, we tore up that neighborhood. Pit bulls, dogs, people with guns. But you know why we did it? Why did we do it? Because we just wanted to prove. No, we did it because we were going to build the kingdom of God, hell or high water. And that's what it's going to take. And that's a spirit that God's going to have to put in your heart. It takes a committed group of people. The youth were involved. You read through chapter 3. It would, time and again it would say the sons of this guy, the sons of that guy, the sons of this guy built this part of the wall. They built that part of the wall. The youth were involved. I thank God for the youth in our church. I thank God for the leader of the youth, Dave Sanchez and Liz, and the work that they've done in our church. Amen. Because they're raising up 
They're raising up the people that will be behind this pulpit, walking on this platform, preaching to the people that are here 40 years from now. The youth were involved. You know, in that article they say many, many churches age out. Have you ever heard that term, age out? They go, the problem, the reason many of the churches will, will shutter their doors is because the congregation has aged out. What does that mean? They got, all got old and died. The church is a mighty work of God. And that's what this church is. And there are many, many reasons. Every one of our pastors to the man who came here had the spirit of Pastor Mitchell. That was their pastor. They were his disciples. And that's a big, huge blessing for us. We are the recipients of that blessing. Amen. And we've kept the main thing, the main thing, because of that. So Nehemiah employs this genius strategy. Get the people to have a vested interest. And isn't that what our ministry is about? You know, we laugh about the thongs. Sandals. I'm going to call them thongs. Sandals. I did wear sandals, okay? Flip-flops. We weren't exactly, you know, high-flying then. I guess Pastor Pennington was the kind of guy that just, he took whatever he got. Scraped the bottom of the barrel and up came Mark Looney. All right, Mark, you're the song leader. I am? Right? I did. I remember Larry Reed telling me one time, we had a revival, and he said, Brother, you need to be more, more confident of yourself. I don't know what I said. I, he must have thought, looked, realized I was scared behind there, you know. He goes, be more confident in yourself. God can use your life. Remember him telling me that? And I thought, well, okay. I believed it. I want to talk about a temptation that we have to overcome. And that is the temptation that, that we've all had probably, and that is that who we're supposed to be what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do is somewhere out there. That's the temptation we have to overcome. My destiny is somewhere out there. You say, well, what if I'm called to uh, Outer Mongolia? Praise God. Go to Outer Mongolia. But God will grab you and pull you out there and take you over there. But I'm talking about right now. Your destiny, your purpose, and your calling is not distant. It's right outside your front door. It's in front of your face. It's the empty chair next to you that needs to have somebody sitting in it. That's your calling. It's to build the kingdom. It's to be on the outreach. It's to be a soul winner. Can anybody say amen tonight? You, you, you know, what we, there's a temptation to say, you know what, somewhere out there, my ministry is yonder. You know, it's somewhere on the seven seas or the seven continents or something, you know. My, my, my destiny is, and, and the purpose of God is elsewhere. No, 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 no. Right now, the purpose of God is in front of you. It's that empty chair again next to you to build the kingdom. Familiarity does have a way to breed contempt, as they say. And the truth is this. We have to avoid the temptation to overlook the significance of what we see every day. We have to avoid that. One of the biblical definitions for a fool is found in Proverbs 17, 24. It says, a discerning person Keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. It's out there. It's something new. It's, a, it's like I said, it's a shiny penny. 
What the writer of Proverbs is saying is, is a fool is somebody who doesn't see the obvious. He sees everything except which is in front of his own nose. And your will of God for you is right in front of you until God moves you somewhere else. Are you with me tonight? And I'm, I'm talking to about a temptation of elsewhere or later. You know, men... You don't wait until you become the door director to become a spiritual man. Hey Amen. You should already have prayer nailed down. You should already have soul winning nailed down. You know, it's not elsewhere. It's not yonder. It's not after next conference. Oh, I hope pastor calls my name. I hope he calls us into the office and offers my wife and I to be the next uh, 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 concert director. Don't wait till then. A fool waits till then because his eyes are somewhere else rather than the work that is right before you, right where you're at. And I'm telling you again, this, is a, this has been a key, I believe, to the success of this congregation because it's not out there. It's right here. Can, you, can anybody say amen tonight? The, whatever is in reach of your hand you should do it with all of your heart, the Bible tells us. We, we're not to sit on the dock of life and wait our turn. We're to do God's will now because days come and days go by and opportunities that are within your grasp will fall by the wayside because we're tempted with over there. See, this is, a, this is a common thing that happens when God is building a church. I remember, you know, it, when I first got saved, I remember an opportunity that came to me to go down to Laughlin, which at that time had what would have been considered our mother church, the Bullhead Church. I could have went down there and ran a, a, a construction job down there. And I remember that. Elsewhere, I thought, I could go to the Bullhead Church. I, I, I could still be saved. I could still do the will of God. And I thank God that I didn't do that. Because there's a temptation of elsewhere that, that comes upon us. I'm a firm believer now. I was then, but I'm even more now that where God saves you, where God touches you, is where you should serve him. I know sometimes it may not work that way, but I believe with all my heart that is God's will. Jacob found the golden ladder right where he was at, didn't he? Moses found the burning bush in a familiar desert that he, he, he worked and shepherded for 40 years. Did you ever think about it? Peter walked on the waters he had fished all his life. It was, the miracles was right there. They weren't in some far off land. They weren't in some far off place. There are miracles in front of us. And our duty isn't elsewhere. Right now, it's right here, right outside your door and in the church that you're in right now. How many agree with me tonight? We live in the house of the golden windows. This is what's going to make a church last. I remember seeing Gary Dodd's testimony about Harvey Jett, rock and roll player, you know, and I remember that concert. And uh, in that little building, we, we, we opened the doors, and I don't know how many hundreds of people showed up, but there was... So many that we just packed the building and then had to leave the front door open. And there were all kinds of people milling out front. And most of them were Christians. Now I will say it because it's long gone, but from Dove Ministries. <laughs> Pastor Payne remembers Dove Ministries. And I remember standing out there, going out there, and I remember seeing some people that I happened to kind of know from around, you know, the neighborhood and stuff. And I remember them walking up to me and going, well, what is this? What is this? Potter's house. And I go, it's, it's our church. They went, this is a church? They go, 
They go, well, we go to Dove Ministries. You know, they had like four or 5,000 people or something like that, you know. And uh, you know what that did? That ticked me off. <laughs> that, that ticked me off. They, they were disrespecting my 900 square foot Potter's House church. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, one day, one day, you should see the people. You know, the reality is this. They don't exist anymore. That whole ministry is washed up. But the potter's house stands <laughs> 40 years later, amen, still stands. And we live in the house with golden windows. And listen to me, I'm closing. You need to think of your church as the greatest place on earth. Because if you don't, you won't give your whole life to it. You won't give your time to it. You won't make hard decisions about life Maybe things that you think you could do better or you could get more. You, you, you will make the wrong decisions because it's just, it's just a church. But you know what? God puts something, a gift, I believe, in the hearts of the people in this church. And he's still doing that. That's what encourages me tonight. I still see people here that have been saved three, four years, two years. And I can know you love your church. You value this church. You've given this place your life. You're involved in ministry. You're doing the will of God. And that is a precious thing. And don't ever lose that. Your church is the house with golden windows. There is no better place. Because when you build the church, do you know you're building something that's going to outlast you? Something good. You leave behind a real legacy. I don't care if you're, you're the preacher. I, it doesn't matter. I like what Pastor Lamb, when he talked about the, the house-to-house groups, he, he told us straight up, he goes, you guys, you think I'm the most important person in this church? He goes, I'm not the most important person in this church. And really, that attitude is what makes him the most important church, person in this church, really, is his heart. And, and by the way, Pastor, thank you for allowing me to preach this. 40th anniversary amen we got a real gift when God brought in our pastor and this is why this place keeps going forward and it has exploded and what God is doing that's why it's his heart he's for every one of you he has no favorites he's glad you're here and he's glad God's doing something for you and in you, and he prays for you, and so do we. You're going to build something that's going to outlast you. You know, a lot of things are important. I know work's important. I know those kinds of things are important. Family's important, you know, and, 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 and making money. But you know what? I, 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 you know, I don't think you're ever going to read on the headstone of somebody that guys just says, you know, I wished I would have made more money and spent more time at the office. And that doesn't exist. It's people. It's people and the legacy of people. You're building a wall and your duty lies right at the door. God said, Moses, what's in your hand? And it's with what is within your reach that you're going to use to do the will of God. What, what's in your hand? What gift do you have that you can use for the kingdom of God? What gifting has God given you? that you can use. It's a, it's a great thing to see people get involved in the ministry of the gospel. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Don't say someday, do it now. Nehemiah said, it's right outside your front door. Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatever your hand finds to do, it, do it with all of your might. For there is no work, a device, or knowledge, or wisdom in the grave when you're gone. Amen? Smart words. Do it now. Do what you can do now and let God help you to finish well. You know, I don't know. Maybe we are the last church. Maybe we're, you know, Laodicean church. We're, we're the last one. We're the last one Jesus talked to. Right? Are we? I don't know. I don't know. Could be. 
We have to finish well. December 9th of last year was the 400th anniversary of the first recorded sermon preached in America. I'm talking about recorded. Where back in those days they would actually go to listen to the preacher preach and somebody would take notes and they would publish it in the paper. And so there, the first sermon recorded was preached by a man named Samuel Cushman. And Samuel Cushman was sent to America to encourage the pilgrims. There was something like 52 of them left. 45 had passed away already. He came to encourage them, and his text is this. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. We should think about others and not about ourselves. You know what makes this church great? Is it wasn't about us. It was about others. It always has been. How do you know that, Pastor? Because we still have Saturday morning outreach. We still do concerts. We still go to the parks. Uh, we still have night under the stars. We still have festivals, carnivals, plays. Uh, we still send vans uh, out to cities uh, uh, that are close to us uh, because it's all about others. You're never greater, amen, than when you think about others. Samuel Cushman used this text. He knew these people were going to build a great nation. And he says, you know what? If we think about others and not ourselves, we're going to be at our best. And this has been the driver of our church for the last 40 years. It's about others. You know, the, the old saying, the church is the only institution that exists not for its members, but for those who will become members. Amen? And that's still who we are. Isn't that right? How, how many can say amen? Because great saints of God don't exist for themselves. They exist for others. And great churches reach for others. And that's what makes the church great. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for a moment. Thank God for what he's doing in our lives. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your good grace. Let's bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord. I just want to make an appeal to anybody that might have come tonight and by invitation or just it happened in here. I don't know. But I want to talk to you because it's about you. You know, when the preacher's done preaching, it becomes about you in the pew. It becomes about your relationship with God. It comes about your soul. It, it becomes about the important thing, and that is, will you make heaven your home? Are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you a Christian tonight? Can you look back on a day you bowed your knee to Christ and received Him and, and were changed and transformed, and you left behind your sin, and you began to live for God? Can you remember that day? Did that, has that day happened for you? If it ha hasn't, it needs to happen right now tonight. Yes, right now tonight. Do you know that you can walk out of here by making one decision? You can walk out of here with all of your past under the blood of Jesus, forgiven, a clean slate, justified, made right in the eyes of God, saved and on your way to heaven, forgiven by one decision. And that decision is to repent and believe. It's to say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm living wrong. I'm going the wrong way. I'm doing wrong. I've sinned against you, sinned against my family. I've sinned against myself. And I don't want this life anymore. And I'm sorry for this. I want to repent. I want to, I want to turn from what I'm doing and go the opposite direction, live for you from this night forward. And you believe that the only way is Jesus Christ, because he is. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. Maybe you're here tonight with us, and God is speaking to you right now. He's talking to you, and he's saying, son, daughter, I'm calling your name right now. I'm laying hold of your heart. That's what's happening to you right now. You feel God speaking to you because you're not right with him. You're away from him. It's time to make the decision. Today's the day. 
You say, I want to make a decision for Jesus. I want to get my heart right. I want to be forgiven. I want to repent. I want to get saved tonight. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up. Lift your hand up right where you're seated. Say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to get my heart right. Where? Over there. Okay, I see that hand over there. Anybody else? Lift your hand right now, right where you see it. Quickly, just slip your hand up and say, I admit I'm not right with God, but I want to get my heart right with God right now tonight. Slip it up quickly, right where you're seated. I see your hand. Young man, you're kneeling down over there. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Lift your hand. Say, I want to, I want to make a decision to be right with God. Maybe you're a backslider. You're away from God. At one time you walked with Jesus, but tonight you went elsewhere. You did your own thing. You've gone your own way. You're backslidden away from God now. And your relationship with God is in shambles. It's not right. There's something wrong. And you know it. You feel it. You recognize it. And tonight you want to get your heart right with God. You want to come back to the Lord. You want to rededicate your life to Him. Lift your hand up right where you're seated and say, pray for me. I'm backslidden. I'm not saved. I'm away from God. Anybody, lift a hand quickly. All right, I want... This young man over here, he's, he's kneeling down. One of, maybe one of the disciples can grab him. He, he's, convi- he's under conviction. Right here, he's kneeling down in, in, in the chair there. Grab him. He lifted his hand. There's a brother in the back. Where'd he go? Come on, brother. Come to the altar. Come on to the altar. It's all right. We're going to have somebody pray with you. Maybe I didn't see your hand. You need to get up and come to the altar. Get right with God. Dave's going to pray for you, bro. Just kneel down right there. Saints. What a wonderful time we're having in God. And we need to look back. We need to reflect. and We need to come out of this with a great appreciation for what God's doing. And we need to come out of this with a determination that, you know what? We're continuing on. We're we're ramping it up. Maybe God spoke to you tonight. Maybe you've been looking elsewhere. Maybe you've had the attitude. You succumbed to the temptation of elsewhere. Maybe God spoke to you and challenged you to say, you know what? God's put me in the best thing I've ever experienced in my life. I'm going to give it my all. Jesus, I'm going to give you my all. I'm going to labor. I'm going to get behind my pastor. I'm going to do God's will. I want to open the altars. If God spoke to anybody tonight, I encourage you to come. Seal this and find a place to pray. And say, God, put this spirit in me. Put a fighting spirit in my heart, in my soul. We we serve God in the house with the golden windows. This is where God's put you. Come and make a commitment. Hallelujah. Come and lay hold of God. Praise God tonight. Praise God. I will wait on you, Lord, till you come. I can almost God, hear touch the trumpet Your church, sound. God, these precious people, God, that you touched, in the that you're working in and using, I thank you tonight. I will be gone. I give you praise, God, and thanksgiving for I all that you're I can't wait to hear the word. Well done, well done, faithful servant. Speak to these new converts, God. Speak to their hearts. Stir them, God, to do a work for you, God. Help them to see. It's right in front of their eyes. It's right out their front door. This is heaven. Hallelujah. I can't wait to hear the words, well done. Praise God. I wait on you, Lord, till till you come. come. And I I can can almost hear the trumpet sound. In the twinkling of an eye will be gone. I can't wait to hear the words. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done, faithful servant. Well done. Thank the Lord. Enter in. 
raise up your people tonight, well God, done. to do a great work. This is heaven. Thank God. Hallelujah. I can't wait to hear the words. Well Why don't we thank God? Let's give God praise. He's worthy. Wonderful Jesus, we love your name. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Rama, Mama, Mandala, Labanda, Masata, Labako, Tolaboko. Glory to God. Father, we love and thank you tonight. We give you all the praise. Hallelujah. Praises to God. Oh, wonderful Jesus. Wonderful God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. La ma 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 da la la batai. Praises to God. Hallelujah. I feel good. Amen. I'm thanking God. And uh, living for God and doing God's work will keep you young. It'll keep you vibrant. Stay excited. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to dismiss and we're Do not miss tomorrow morning service. We have Pastor, Pastor Payne's going to be ministering. And it's going to be powerful. You need to come. If you notice somebody that's not here tonight, please give them a call. Shoot them a text. Say, be in church tomorrow morning, 930 Adult Bible Study, 1030 service. We're going to have a wonderful time tomorrow celebrating with a luncheon. Don't want to miss that. And so I'm looking, really looking forward to it. There's a brief meeting for all the Bible study leaders and their wives in the multi-purpose room right after service. And so I'll be faithful to that. We appreciate that. We're going to dismiss in a word of prayer. We're going to go our way. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother uh, Pastor Eric Bakke if he'd lift his voice and ask God to bless us as we go tonight. Amen.